Most researchers in the field of intelligence believe that intelligence represents some combination, some interaction between genes and environment. So I think that there are very few people today who would say that genes play no role. And at the same time, there are probably no people who would say that environment plays no role. Rather, uh, the genes you have interact with the environment in which you live in order to produce the kind of intelligence you have. There's also a concept known as emergenesis, where the idea is that the genes for abilities may not be totally additive. In other words, if you have some of this and some of that and some of the other thing, none of those individually might make someone particularly smart or creative, but those things in combination may result in someone's being smarter, more creative. We're talking about not three or four or five, or even 30, 40 or 50, but 300, 400, 500 genes, each of which contribute a small amount of the variance to a particular trait, like say reading disability. And there are ways now where we can easily, if we had those, say, 500 genes, we can easily assess them in psychological studies. And it comes back to you the next day, and then you've got a genetic risk indicator. If you get that gene set that's predicting reading disability at, say, seven or eight or nine years of age, how early does it appear? Does it appear in language at two and three years of age? And early detection may mean early intervention. For Joyce Bishop, intervention did not come until later in life. It wasn't until I was 35 and my doctor sent me to a center in Los Angeles and they determined I am able to understand what I hear on a fourth grade level. If that says, VAPS, show me apps. And that hasn't changed even at my age today. She asked me how far did I get through school. And by then I was feeling a little spunky, so I said, I asked her to guess. And she guessed the 10th grade. And so then I told her I was working on my second master's degree. And she pushed her chair back and she said, wow, you work really hard in school, don't you? And I immediately, big crocodile tears went down my face. But for the first time, it was acknowledged that I was trying very, very hard. Where before that, people just thought I didn't care and I wasn't paying attention. And it was amazing that once I knew what was wrong, it's very easy for me to work around it now. Advances in genetic testing may also point to interventions specific to a particular disability. If we've got the most direct genetic measure possible, that is DNA variation, we can then incorporate it in our studies of the environment and look at the way in which the genetic risk, say for reading, interacts with the environment. So if there's an environmental intervention, it might work differently, like a reading program might work better for some children than others based on genetic differences. That would be an example of a gene-environment interaction. That's the hot topic now that everybody's talking about, because in recent years there have been a few papers that show that genetic differences interact with specific environments. But I think a larger topic that people haven't talked about that I think will be even more important in psychology is gene-environment correlation, the way in which genetic factors expose children to different environments. And once we get these genes, that will be, I think, one of the more interesting aspects of the nature-nurture interplay. <laughs> 85 words. <laughs>